Yes, we're back. It is episode 28 of the Hibs Ramble. Uh, Craig isn't here this evening, um, so it's me, Liam, is your host, and with me is Mark and Sean. How's it going, lads? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. You? Yeah, not so bad. How are you, Mark? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Why, why is Craig off again? Uh, I'm not too sure, actually. He texts me saying that he, he, couldn't, he couldn't make it tonight. Um, and something something came up, so I'm it's sure it's that, I'm sure it's very important, and uh, we wish him the best of luck in whatever he's doing. I uh, <laughs> well, we just jumped straight in it, boys. Um, two two against London United on Saturday wasn't a great game. It was probably one of the one of the worst two twos I've ever watched in my entire life. One of the you coldest two should... twos I've ever been to as well. Oh my lord. I've seen a lot of people moaning about the cold, and I thought it was just me. I thought I just hadn't prepared for it well enough, but it was absolutely Baltic. But um, the team came out. We knew that Cadden wasn't going to be starting. Um, so the only change was Will Fish came in. Cadden went out, uh, and a couple of little positional changes. Ryan Poche started in defensive midfield, and George Campbell went to right back. Mark, when the team came out, were you surprised to see that Will Fish was the one that came in? Uh, I wouldn't say surprised. I kind of thought that Campbell would move to fullback, even though we didn't want it. We discussed it um, on the last podcast. We didn't really want him playing there because it not only not his natural position, but it leaves a gap in midfield where he should be. Um, it worried me, not going to lie. Seeing Fish and Rocky playing at the back together worried me because they're both young. For me, they're, they both need walked through games. And you've seen that straight away. They they just looked on edge. They Rocky played... It's one of Rocky's worst games this season, I would say. And I think that's just because he didn't have that presence next time in Ryan Portis or Paul Hamlin. Um, so that was the first thing that worried me. Campbell being out of position, that did worry me. I thought Campbell again... Um, well, not again. I thought he was poor compared to how he played at Motherwell. Um, so wasn't surprised, but certainly did worry me when I seen the, the team sheet. Yeah, I mean... Like you say, I don't think we started particularly well with Rocky and Fish as a defensive pairing. Um, Sean, we we saw very early on it was a quite a different way that we were starting the game. We weren't on the front foot. We were kind of pegged back a little bit, and there was a an initial error um, in the first few minutes between uh, between Marshall and Rocky and Fish, and it nearly let Dundee United into score. Were you thinking the worst when that happened? Yeah. Um... I think it's probably just more so to do with Ryan being in midfield as well. Sometimes when he's at centre half and he tries to play those kind of passes, they they come off and they look all right. Um, but you know, he's he's very uh, unconvincing in in centre midfield. Other than obviously Motherwell last week when he was on the front foot and really good and exactly what we needed at that point. But um, I think Ryan Portis in midfield costs costs us. Um, in pretty much all the games that he's been there, it takes a, a big hole out of our centre halves, leaves us very uh, exposed as well. I feel, um, and I kind of it just it sums up where we are at the moment, where we're having to put our best centre half into, into centre midfielder uh, and become making him sorry become a centre midfielder, um, where his positional awareness just isn't as great in that position as it is as a centre half, where he can see, you know, the full picture, so to speak. Do you think can, it's Johnson? Do you think it's Johnson that said I want you to play there, or do you think it's more? I know obviously Johnson will make the decision, but do you think it's Porteous that's saying, ah, "This is I, I prefer to play here because I get on the ball more, I see it more, I can drive forward," or do you think it's just Johnson saying, "Nah, I think you're good there, go go for it." Well, I think it's maybe a bit of both. You see how good he is, you know, with the ball at his feet, and then oftentimes he'll like lump a big ball up and over the top and it'll find someone and we'll be talking about it on the podcast and going oh that was that was wonderful from Portis exactly like how he played um last week against Motherwell but I mean it must be we've never seen Portis in midfield until Johnson's come in so it must be something that he's either said to him or I don't know maybe something that he's seen in training I think I think Ryan does have the attributes to play in that kind of six role in midfield. Um, he was hard hitting, 
He likes to get in people's faces. He likes to break up play. He's able to read the play really well, and he can pick those kind of passes out. But I think, it, especially at the weekend there, it just really exposed how inexperienced he is at that role. Um, in my opinion, we'll come on to their first goal in a sec, but in my opinion, he's probably one of the key attributes as to why we lost that goal. Um, and taking him out of the back line and putting him into the midfield just gives Mark all the reason for to make all his points that he made at the beginning very, very valid. Um, everything that Mark said there was spot on, and I, I thought the exact same thing. So um, I do want to touch on Lee Johnson's comments at the end of the game, but we'll obviously touch on that later on. Um, but I think this isn't the time to be trying Ryan Porteous in, in centre midfield. Do you know what I mean? Whether he's got the attributes or not, we need them. No. If we had two solid centre halves that were, if we had two Ryan Portuses at centre half, then I would say, aye, let's go, let's give it a bash and maybe put him as a six. But we, we can't be trying something like that, especially with the form that we've got at the moment. Yeah, no, for sure. And you say about the hole that it, it leaves in the defence with the with the inexperience of Rocky and, and Will Fish. I know with, that we're all big Rocky fans, but, you know, he does need someone, like you say, Mark, to coach him through the game. And it showed when they scored their first goal. It was a throw-in uh, flicked on by Zoom into the box and then flicked on by Fletcher in the middle. And it seemed as if no one in the defence was interested in sticking a foot in or, you know, even thinking about making a tackle. Uh, found Middleton and I still I've watched it back about ten ten times and I don't understand how it how it goes in from where his feet are and like how he hits it and stuff. I don't get it. But it had to be him though, Mark. It had to be Glenn Middleton at score. Hi, it was always going to be him. I thought Fletcher might get a goal to be honest and I was wondering whether or not he'd celebrate against us, but I uh, it had to be Middleton. But I just think the first goal we we still hadn't started the game. Even the fans, <laughs> I think the home crowd's been like quite good this year. I think you know it's it's usually quite buzzing and maybe buzzing's a bit strong, but it's there's a bit of something. Even the fans, the fans weren't in it. It was quiet. The there was no tempo. There was just nothing going on in the park apart from Dundee United putting pressure on us. So for me, it wasn't really a surprise when we conceded. And, you know, there's probably is a few individual errors in there. You know, you could you could shout out um, Porto and Will Fish. But for me, it was the entire team. They, they just didn't look like they had switched on from that point. I think it took maybe, it probably took until the second half. I think the whole first half we were like that, to be honest. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I, th- I don't think anyone comes out shining from that goal, Sean. Yeah. No, um, what summed up for me when I was watching it back is as soon as the throw's taken, Aidan McGeady's furious and his hands are in the air because he knows what's coming. Like, Ryan Port just doesn't pick up the runner. Uh, he doesn't, no, sorry, Ryan Port just doesn't pick up Middleton. So, again, his you know, positional awareness is is off there. Um, McGinnis tries to pass on Doom to Newell. Newell's slow to react. And I remember teaching... Burns that that throwing routine. Every team I went to have to teach that throwing routine, so I don't understand how they've not seen it coming. Like, you know, one they just switch, one goes short, one goes long, and then they do the long throw in behind the midfielder that that, that they've just moved. It's basic, basic stuff. Um, don't underestimate Fletcher's wee touch though. Um, massive, still a massive fan of him, and I think we were wrong to turn him down or or not go for him. What whatever you want to believe happened in the summer um, but the touch from him makes that goal obviously what Mark said and what you've said no one comes out in a shining light there defensively we're all over the shop and yeah, I no. think again that, that comes that comes from maybe Ryan not being there because uh, our, our shape's all over the place and then he's it, for me at fault for the goal I think it does I, th- I think Porter just being in the midfield does make a a difference to that goal because, like you say, he's not as positionally aware as, you know, a, a defensive midfielder would be in that position. Plus, we don't then have him at the back. So it's it's a difficult one. It is a difficult one. And like you say, Di, the Fletcher, his football IQ, uh, we were talking about last week, um, sublime. I would have loved to have had him well, in, a, um, in a white shirt on Saturday. What I noticed as well is after the goal, 
again, I don't want to dwell on it too much because we all agree that all of us, uh, all of us, all of them were were very very poor at, at defending the whole lot. But Marshall seems to have a go at Stevenson. I don't. I noticed it at the game, and I, I wasn't sure if it was Stevenson or Rocky was having a go. At it, and I watched it back, and I'm leaning towards him moaning at Stevenson. And I kind come of, from that side though. I know, but Stevenson's touched tight on the edge of the box, eh, not the edge of the box, on the the byline. So once the throw-ins happened, why is he maybe not shuffling further in to maybe put a bit of pressure on ultimately where where Doom then runs into? Yeah, I don't um, think Stevenson had a good game at all, to be honest. No, no. And I don't know if that kind of contributes again to the whole back line maybe being all over the shop. We switched from a four to a three and then a four again during the match as well. So it's just a just a catalogue of errors for that goal. Yeah. yeah. Well, we did move to a three. And that's when we got the equaliser. Um, a nice big long ball from Ryan Porteous. <laughs> the, exact, the, the kind of the things that weren't coming off before uh, we scored the goal up to Josh Campbell. Mark, you said that he's much better in forward areas than he is in um, defensive areas. Who Nick uh, just taps on in his bit and it's a superb finish. Uh, he kind of jinks it round one of the defenders and fires it into C- uh, not Seagrist. Who's it? Birigetti. Birigetti's far corner. Did you think then, oh, that's that, we'll be, uh, floodgates open now? I thought, I certainly thought it would ignite something. Say, right, we've got a goal undeservedly. You know, it was against her in a play for me. So I thought that would maybe spark a bit of life into us. Say, right, let's get our arse into gear. We've managed to score a goal when we've been really, really poor. So if we can up our game a bit, we can go ahead and win the game. And this bit, I mean, you've got to give credit to them. It's come from nothing, really. You know that, like you say, it's a long ball from Port S. John um, Campbell's touched it on, and what an unbelievable finish that is! That just shows the confidence he's got, and it also shows the work that he's been doing whilst he's been away getting injured. He looks bigger, he looks stronger, he looks sharper, quicker. Everything. He just looks like he's bulked up a wee bit, and then that's just an unbelievable finish. So you think, right? We'll kick on now. We'll go. We'll take control of the game, and we'll hopefully win it. And it went. It literally as soon as the fans sat back down. And it went back to the centre circle. It was like hardly happened. Yeah. There was no atmosphere. The, the fans weren't up for it. I know it was a cold day and all that. And listen, I, I can't talk because I was the same. I, I didn't make a peep. But it went back to the exact same what it was before. Dundee United back on top. Hibs really poor and flat as a pancake. Yeah. We'll just go back to the goal for a second, Sean. How, just how sharp is Nisbet? I know we spoke about it at length last week. But it makes such a difference having someone who is... So, I mean, we were talking about positional awareness just a minute ago with Porteous, but the positional awareness for Nisbet <clears throat> and the way that he moves and the, the space that he gets in is superb, isn't it? Yeah, that, that touch just before he hits it to get that extra yard um, can be underestimated. I think the, the touch gives him a better angle at goal and he gives him the extra space. I think maybe... All of our other attackers probably would have taken that touch and hit straight away and wouldn't have found that extra yard. So again, it just comes down to his awareness that where he was at that time, he needed that extra angle. So that extra touch is exactly what he needed. And I kind of just, it just kind of speaks volumes about where he is personally at the moment and the running form that he's on. And I mean, long may it continue because if it doesn't, we're struggling. Yeah, I think it's de- it's definitely a, a high confidence shot that you take that goal you know it was one thing to collect the ball and then think about hitting it but to then shift over make that extra yard and then even hit across the goal it still looked like a tight angle um but <laughs> all our hard work was undone five minutes later i've got down here it was a long ball from united's left stevenson sucked in to the the player that's that's just inside and harks goes round the back collects it and I know it takes a nick when it goes in and it's a really really good finish but I can't help but feel that if we just switched on more defensively then that goal just doesn't happen Mark I've actually not seen the goal I was in the toilet while it was oh, going really? I've not watched the replay I came well, back that's what happened. Like, right, right I came back out 1-1 one, one, come on let's kick on and then Dundee United were jumping up and down so I thought right so I've actually not seen the goal but I have heard that um it wasn't Stevenson's best moment, so I'll, I'll let Sean take this one. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much just filling on for what, what Liam said there. So, 
my breakdown of it is the ball obviously the ball comes in right so at that point mark we've we're, we're three at the back but the three center halves are very narrow instead of when we are used to being successful with three at the back you have one that's maybe in around the d and then you've got the other two either side of the box and it's pretty pretty wide that obviously allows your full backs to be further up but they were very narrow ball comes into um fletcher who's very central in my opinion it should be Portress that should be commanding that. He should have been the one that went for it. It was him that was having the battle with Fletcher the whole time, the whole match. But Rocky's the one that comes out. Because Rocky's the one that comes out of position, Stevenson then comes in to fill it um, ever so slightly, which then leaves him 2v1 on his side. But because we've got this thing at the moment, you're leaving Yuan and Megidi so far up the park, high and wide, even if McGeady was to attempt to try and track back, he obviously wouldn't have made it. So he was over the halfway line. Our two centre midfielders at the time, McGuinness and Newell, were on the same side, on the right side, when the ball was switched. So they were out of play, so they couldn't have even supported them. Ball comes in, Stevenson wins, eh, no Stevenson, sorry, Fletcher wins the flick on from, obviously, Rocky again. In my opinion, it should be Potro that's doing that, but there we are, that's where we find ourselves. Stevenson then doesn't win the second ball either. And then he's just playing catch up for there. He's then got to try and get out to is it Hart? Yeah, Hark's. Hark's eye. And then he's he's beaten too easily. Uh the the easiest cut in as you like, fake cut in, he's just very unlucky that it takes takes a deflection and then obviously hits the back of the net. But for me, there's a catalogue of errors again from whether you want to pinpoint it being a narrow back three or even your midfield. We found we saw a lot last week where our centre midfielders were filling in to help our centre halves, but they weren't able to do it on this on this goal because they were both on the same side of the pitch, which for me cost us as well. But again, it kind of comes down to how narrow our back three were and the fact that we like to leave our, our wingers high and wide. So yeah. although, although Stevenson had a bad game, he wasn't helped by it others on the pitch. I just feel like it's now every week we're talking about individual errors, individual errors, and it's costing us. And I, I know at the start of the season we're saying individual errors, but we're defending well as a unit. But it seems like now we're making individual errors and we're not defending well as a unit. And I, I don't know what's happened. I, I Honestly, it, it's it's kind of baffling. And it's pretty scary as well, knowing that Porteous is probably going to leave this window, Mark. Where do you see, like, how how do we improve it? Uh, my opinion is we're making individual errors because we're playing as individuals. We're not playing as a team anymore. And I think that comes from, and we talked about in the last podcast, just how often we're changing the team, how often we're changing the shape, how often we're changing the defence. For me, changing the start and 11 so often and changing the shape so often is absolutely criminal. The most successful teams that you'll see this season play with a very similar 11. I heard... Um, I know Arsenal are maybe a, a wee bit different out of our league, but Arsenal are top of the Premier League, right? They, they probably shouldn't be there, but I think seven of their first 11 players have played every single game this season. So that And that's because the manager knows his best team, he knows the best shape. And again, I'm not comparing us to Arsenal, but we need to know our best 11, we need to know our best shape. We're in January, no far away from February, and I can't mind, apart from that four-game we win streak we went on, that's the only time that we've played with any sort of consistent team. And it's always changing. And that is why I think we're making more and more of these individual errors because we're not playing as a team. You can't be playing as a unit when you're chain-chopping and changing every single week. I think it makes it so difficult playing, especially defensively, playing as a defensive unit and not... You know, changing the centre half, changing the full back, changing the shape from that that's gonna cause a lot of issues. And you're seeing it, you're seeing all the mistakes that are coming and it's all from transition, it's it's all from um probably the shape and everything like that. So yeah, for me that's why we're making so many of these mistakes. And it's it's frustrating. It really is frustrating, but um you know, and the second half wasn't an awful lot better to be honest. I feel that we dominated more of the ball. Again, kind of me, it was kind of akin to second half at Tynecastle where Dundee United were kind of sitting off and saying, well, moan then, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough sort of thing. 
Uh, McCurdy hit the bar. I can't think of many other opportunities that we had. I think that ended up being offside anyway. I was absolutely, I was desperate. On yeah, that yeah. You and you and in the build up was offside, but so I, I, would, have, I would have got desperate you. on it going in. Um, but then eventually in the 92nd minute or 93rd minute, whatever it was, big ball in from Joe Newell. And again, Kevin Nisbet saves the day. Um, twist and turn inside the box. And can I just say that he had absolutely no right to even think about shooting, never mind shoot, never mind actually score from where he was and the amount of players that were around him. I mean, and in the end, the goalie doesn't even move. I don't think the goalie sees the ball when he shoots. It's a superb finish, and where the hell would we be, Sean, without Kevin Nisbet? He scored. What is that? At seven and six. Oh, now. Seven and six, but he's the only he's the only one that scored, right? Is that right? So the last ever last seven goals have all been him. Is that correct? Uh, uh, no, okay. Kyle McGinnis scored against uh, Livingston. Kyle McGinnis got a couple against Livingston. I, I would. I'm really, really concerned if. If he aggravates aggravates an injury or 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 just loses his form or maybe takes a penalty misses it and his head goes down and that's that's him covered that I'm really really concerned. Um, my only that's my only hope going into into this weekend is the fact that he's on blistering form and it could just grab something for anywhere because as we both know he's Scotland's best striker so. Um, I guess we'll, well, we'll just need to hope that he turns up on Sunday. Yeah, I think, I, well, I, ho- I hope he will anyway. We'll, and we'll talk about Sunday later on, but then the game finished. I, I see we scored a last minute equaliser. And to me, there was, there was still booze at full time. It was still flat. It was, it, I mean, it, it was just pish, really. Um, I think a lot of people will come away from Easter Road feeling the same. Mark, it was, it felt like a defeat, didn't it? Yeah, it was a really, really toxic atmosphere, actually. Um, even from the get-go, it was like people, and again, I go back to, you know, it was a horrible, freezing, wet day, so people probably couldn't be arsed, they just wanted to get home, but it felt really toxic, and it's no been like that for a while. I know that there's the people that are calling for Johnson's head and all that, but a Saturday just felt like it was just that really toxic environment. And there was people around me, I had, I had a go at a couple of people just for slating people like Campbell. You know, Campbell's been one of our best players and he was p- being played out of position. So fair enough, he makes a slap pass or whatever, but, you know, he, the lad's playing out of position. He's still he's still putting a shift. Um, so I, it just it just felt flat, felt... It was a pretty horrible place to be, to be honest. You wouldn't have thought... That we had just scored a ninety-second minute equaliser. You would think even you know, it was silent at full time. There were, I didn't even think there was many boos. There was some at the end of the referee. It was completely silent. It was strange. It was really strange. You just need to compare that ninety-second minute equaliser versus the one that we had earlier on in the season. We what boiled. one? Do you know what, what I mean? <laughs> We've had so many. Um, with, with Boyle's equaliser against Hearts you know what I mean I know that's a derby and I know this is Dundee United but ultimately it's got us the same thing it's got us a point do you know what I mean yeah. it just kind of sums up where the mood within the support is at the moment whether it be towards the board um, whether it be to the recruitment team whether it be to Johnson whether it be to the players I think there's you'd be hard to find a support in that stadium on on Saturday that was happy with all of the things that I just said you know someone will have a gripe about something out of those four things so I think it's maybe just a built up with frustration and yeah hopefully that, that, that disappears sooner rather than later I think as well right I think a lot of people are looking at the table and then that's the reflects their mood as in the C Dundee United are they were bottom I think they're what 10 for 11 wherever they are they're seeing that and thinking, oh, we should be putting this mob away. Fair enough, we probably should have, we should be beating a team like Dundee United, but Dundee United are not, that that league position does not reflect their squad, their players and the way that they're playing at the moment. They will be fighting for top six by the end of the season, I think. Um, so, I fair enough, it's disappointing that we didn't get three points, but it's not as if we were playing a Ross County. <laughs> I know they beat us last time at home anyway, but you know it's <laughs> not like we're playing somebody that I'm thinking, right, we need to turn this mob over. 
they're a good outfit than the United, and I think they'll be top near the top six by the end of the season. I mean, you just look at the quality that they had to bring off the bench, like Jamie McGrath and whoever else they brought off the bench. <laughs> you know <what> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like uh, they they have got a squad of good players. You've said that, and I think if they if they had Liam Fox in from the start of the season, then their their league position would be very very different. You said that last week, Mark, that their defensive record since he came in has been as good as Celtic and Rangers or the I third think at best? At the time, at the time um, their defence was the best in the league, including the old firm. I don't think it's the same anymore, but I think a couple of weeks ago it was. Mm. So, I mean, like the, you can file them under name Uggs. But, um, <laughs> aye. And you wanted to talk about Lee Johnson's comments after the game, Sean. Yeah, there was an interview with um, Luke Shanley, and as we both know, Luke Shanley, diehard hibby. Um could tell that, although he was in a working capacity, you could tell he was letting the fan side to him come through with some of his questions as well, because I saw a lot of people, I didn't watch the interview until today, and it's probably out of more annoyance than anything else. I saw the interview get posted by Sky Sports over the weekend, and I just couldn't bring myself to watch it because I, I knew it would be all the same cliche answers for Lee Johnson and stuff like that. But decided to give it a watch because I was curious as to see what I had to say. And obviously with, with tonight, he mentions at the start of the match about being on the front foot. <clears throat> and I can partially agree with that, but we need to kind of keep up that intensity. Uh, it's, and, then he, and then he goes on to say that we weren't clinical enough with our, deci- with our decision making or anything like that. And says that, when we had the chance to go forward, we weren't taking it as well as we should have. Um, I just <laughs> <laughs> you got a wee visitor there. We sh- was trying to land on my lap there. Um, yeah, so he mentioned that we weren't <clears throat> aggressive enough or brave enough at the start of the match um, to take the game to them, which kind of feeds into what you were saying earlier on. Um, Liam, but the, the part that kind of got me the most, and this is kind of where I've got to kind of give props to, to Luke Shanley, is he mentions on what you, you both spoke about earlier on and the individual errors. And Lee Johnson says individual errors, this is costing us. If we all agree it's a poor go to lose, blah, 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 all, this, all the nonsense. And Luke Shanley's like, we're hearing this every week. Like, this can't continue to happen. Like, what are you doing to stop it? Obviously, he didn't say it like that, but he asked the question. He's like, you keep con- continually saying that this is the reason why we're losing goals. Um, but what are you doing to, to rectify it? And he can't really give an answer at all, which is concerning. He talks about organisation. He talks about that we're soft at conceding goals and he feels like we need a leader and this, that and the other. I do like the fact that Lee Johnson did say that he is looking for a leader and we are actively seeking one. But my concern is, is that going to be a leader How at centre-half? Yeah, is it going to be a leader at centre-half? Is it going to be a leader in centre-mid? And then you'd argue that that would just replace Ryan if Ryan leaves. Whereas we need more than we just... We needed more than that yeah, before ex- he left anyway. Exactly. Um, so that that was my concern. What What annoyed me as well is at the end of the interview... Um, he says that we'll have a better squad at the end of the window than we had at the start. So again, I guess that's up for debate once that happens. Um, but he uses that as an answer to dodge the previous question from Luke, which was um, asking if Lee Johnson is the one that has the final say. And we all know that at Hibs, and at Hibs for a long time, it's all down to the recruitment team whether the manager has the final say or not, he gets proposed these amount of options and then they choose and come to a collective. We are probably all in agreement that the manager should have the final say. Yeah, but I don't Lee, think that that's how it happens in football. No, I know, and Lee Johnson says club. that. Lee Johnson does say that as a collective, but what annoyed me is that he wasn't able to kind of definitively confirm or deny where we're at as a club in regards to the recruiting and where where we want to be. And he kept kind of dodging the answer at the end regarding his impact and his role within the recruitment aspect of it. Well, how much do you think he can actually talk about, though? I know, but I would just... Where we're at just now with the amount of bodies that are leaving, um, 
and the, the the lack of reported people coming in, it's probably just more annoyance on my side. I just want my manager to give us a wee bit more. Um, obviously, Ben came out recently and, and said what he said, whether people were happy or not happy with that. But I'm just starting to get a little bit frustrated with kind of where we're at. And I think that kind of sums up with the, the Melkerson loan as well, where although we're all in agreement he needs our runny games, we spent probably 300 to 420. 400 to 500. Yeah, like if, if reports are to be, be believed, 350 to 420 or 500 grand on him a year ago. And he started 12, he started 12 games, but he's, he's featured in 29 and not scored a single league goal. So we've spent heavy money on him. Yes, if I, I don't see Rotterdam taking up the option to pay for him for, for a million pounds. I know we're getting off topic here. I apologise. I know we'll, You'll, you'll rein me back in in a second. But Rotterdam aren't, aren't going to pay a million pounds for him. As good as a player as I think he is, they're not going to pay that. So he'll be back in the summer. So lot, I just pray that he gets a, a, a runny games there, a runny starts as well, so that 450 or 500 grand that paid for him doesn't actually go to waste. And if you look at the amount of players that we've paid heavy fees for, well, by Hibs standards, heavy fees for, over the last 12 to 18 months, then I'm just kind of more frustrated than anything else and concerned about who we're trying to offload and, and why. And I think what builds up my frustration as well is the fact that we have a lot of what I like to believe, promising youngsters, that even with the amount of people that we're offloading, they're not even getting offered extensions to their deals or even featuring. So, yeah. just to build up. No, it takes us nicely on a, um, the transfer window, actually. And, Sean, you're now not allowed to talk for the next 15 minutes. So, it's just <laughs> taken up. <laughs> Fine, but, yeah, I've got my rant. That's done. I'm done. <laughs> um, you said there, uh, obviously, we found out today that uh, Elias Melkerson has joined Sparta Rotterdam on loan with an option to buy in the summer for a seven-figure sum whether that's one million, whether that's nine million, um, I, doubt, I doubt it's nine million to be honest. But um, wh- whatever that is, you know, he'll either hopefully come back a better player, or we'll get a we'll get we'll get for him more than what we paid, which is good. Uh, we've also seen uh, Jack Braden, but the most surprising one for me is Noah Kenny Mark leaving for Ross County on loan. What did you think when you first saw that? Yeah, it's. It's a strange one. It's a real strange one because it's caused a wee bit of debate as well. I've seen online a lot of people saying it should be happening, a lot of people saying it shouldn't. For me, it should be happening because he's not getting games. Fair enough, he's not getting in the first team, so yes, he needs that run. He's a young lad and needs to get in a team where he's in the first team every single week, getting that experience. What surprises me is, and Sean's touched on it before, he's went from being one of the first names on the team sheet and being involved in probably our best spell of the season, you know, that four wins on the bounce is our only highlight so far. <laughs> Seems like so long ago, yeah. <laughs> And he was a huge part in that. He, I think he, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but started in all four of those, these games. And he was a big, big part of it in that sort of holding midfield where um, Porto and Rocky or Porto and Hanlon at the back and then all of a sudden it just stopped. All of a sudden he was benched and he wasn't getting in and all of a sudden it's like we're bringing on Henderson over him, we're putting Porto in uh, holding midfield over Kenna. We're playing players out of position rather than playing Kenna. It just seems it seems odd, it seems like it's just fell off a cliff. So whether or no something's happened in the background, if Johnson doesn't fancy him, if somebody at the club doesn't fancy him, I don't know, but... Look, I wish him all the best of luck. I hope he gets... The main thing is he gets in the first team, which I think he will. He should breeze into that first team. And he should be playing every week. And he builds up... The good news is it's also in the SPFL. It's in the, the Premier League. So he's building up his experience against teams that he's going to be playing against when he's back at Hibs. For sure. Um, it's always a concern of mine when a player goes abroad because they're not getting that experience of playing in the league. I would have liked if Melkerson had maybe gone in a similar direction and played in even the Scottish Championship, just so he can get that experience of playing here, playing against similar style opposition. Um, but yeah, best luck to both of them. Well, you were talking there about Melkerson uh, 
you know, you would rather he went to a Scottish side. I'm sure I saw somewhere that Motherwell were interested in him and also Dundee were also interested in him. So I wonder if it's maybe just because Sparta Rotterdam have inserted that clause to buy um, for seven figures. Maybe it was too good an offer to turn down. What strikes me as odd, though, is I don't know an awful lot about Sparta Rotterdam or the Eredivisie, but I know that surely they can't be much worse than us. They're, 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 might... six. they're six at the moment. And to put that into perspective, Ajax are third. So how how is then Elias Melkerson going to go from not getting games at a team seventh, eighth in the SPL to then go over to the Eredivisie, which I would imagine is a, s- a similar level, um, you know, with one really big team and a couple of other smaller teams, or smaller, but not as big as Ajax. But you've is, got, you've got, is, is he going to get games? And, and PSV and stuff. I think, I actually think it's a great move for him, regardless of the loan or, or whether it becomes permanent. My concern is if we're loaning him there, there's got to be an obligation that he's got to play so many games or start so many games or get so many minutes because then it's just completely pointless. And Rotterdam clearly rate him because they're, they've, I mean, realistically, you can agree on an option to buy fee, whether you're going to take it up or not, it's a different conversation. Um, but yeah, in my opinion, it's a, it's a great move and, and, and they're a good side for someone of Elias's quality. So I, I do find it very, very strange. I'm just yeah. I don't I don't I don't quite get it. Yeah, I don't quite get it either. And um, just finally uh, on outgoings, Jack Bryden left for Queen of the South, which I thought was an odd one. Craig has always said that he's been very very highly rated within the Hibs Academy and thought that he was going to be the next one to step up. So it's maybe a little bit of a surprise to see him leave. I know he was involved in pre-season and stuff. I don't think I've actually watched some player game for Hibs, so I couldn't comment one way or another. But recalling him from his loan to send them out. I don't think they paid any money for him, did they? Queen of the South, do you know? Own, I'm, I'm not aware of, of the ins and outs of the deal. I don't know if there would have been some kind of compensation involved because... Surely there would be. Because academy he's been or something. Academy. So, yeah, I would like to like think even then it's not going to be that much. <laughs> and even if it is, there'll probably be a like a sell-on clause within it or a buyback yeah. back gym. Oh well, we might get we might get another fifty quid. Twenty quid a month when it gets sold to St Mirren next season or something. Um, <clears throat> so my my next question to you is, what's going to happen first? Hibs are going to sign someone, or we'll get a director of football. God, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. I'm going to say get a director of football. Yeah, well, I mean, we've no heard any. Any rumours at all? I'm sure you put in the chat the other day, James MacArthur maybe been looked at by Hibs. Aye, but there's also like seven other Scottish Premiership teams that he's been linked to. All right. so, and it's maybe just one of them, isn't it? would rather go to. See, at this point, I think I would take Griffiths eh, for half a season. <laughs> take him, just just so we can sign someone. You'll uh, sign, uh, that MacArthur will sign for Hearts so that they can have the oldest midfield in the world. And still dominate <laughs> and in every match possible. Scotland 2013 midfield. They'll get <laughs> James Morrison in as well, probably. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. We heard before the, the window opened, Sean, that it was apparently going to be a busy window, but all we've seen is the is the business the people going out the door. No one's coming yeah, in yeah. the door. I think I think January is a very very tough window to to negotiate in. Anyway, I think it's it's quite good when you're wanting to, in Hibbs's case, get 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 rid of players because we've came out publicly and either slated the players or we've said that we need to move them on. So people will will be more than happy to try and cut us a deal or maybe pay that pay us probably less than what players are worth. Or you, that this is kind of the window where you see loads of loans happen. Johnson's already came out and said it's quality over quantity. Um, he said he's won two based on the current squad, which again is probably concerning. But again, I would ra- I would rather quality over quantity. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's two, assuming we're keeping Ryan, would that then take it to three? I don't know. Um, and when you're wanting quality over quantity, that's going to take time to negotiate whether you... It's up for debate whether that should already be in the pipeline before the January 
window starts, I am a firm believer that you should be working at least two windows ahead. Well, so, I, you would have hoped, given the absolute shambles that we've been watching, you'd think that they were actively working towards... You'd think so, but, but my argument to that is why are we now only deciding at the beginning of January to bring in a director of football? Why did we not review the summer window as soon as it closed and identify that a director of football might have already been needed and then have them in already to help with the recruitment team for January? Whereas now we're probably going to get a director of football after the window's closed and that director of football might not have agreed with the one, two or three deals that we're going to do in January. and then Even he, the deals that have already been done. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's going to be hard. I, I can't see us getting anything over the line anytime soon because, as Lee Johnson said, he wants quality, not quantity. So therefore, we're maybe even going to have to be paying more than we probably should. Um, but again, if it's the right man in the right position, then I'll, I'll be happy with it. Yeah. Mark, do you think that we've not made any signings because some idiot called Liam on the Hibs Rambo uh, transfer window review in the summer said that we had a really good window? Do you think that's why we've not signed anyone yet? <laughs> oh, God, like we touched on, it's it needs to be quality over quantity because it would be easy for whoever's in charge of recruitment, whether that's Ian or Ian Gordon or Lee Johnson, to go and sign another five or six players in January and like summer... 75% of them are absolutely rubbish. So it needs to be one or two players that go, first of all, straight to the first team. I'm sick of it. Like, fair enough planning for the future, but I'm sick of signing 14 year olds for Benfica Z team and then expecting them to like be good in eight years. It's like, no, we need players now. But then Ab- Aberdeen signed the same, same sign a player for the same squad and he turns it to be a world day. Aye, it's just, we need that. players of experience that are experienced in Scottish football that have got a proven track record in Scottish football and that are that go straight into the first team. And fair enough, like we've done all the planning for the like the development squad and I'm well, sure we will be good in a few good. years, like aye. That's what no, we keep, for, no for no giving them new deals and letting them go. <laughs> I know. So the the transfer policy has to change now. Like January we need to make some I'm not saying need they need to be marquee, but they need to be solid and right into the first team and with a proven track record. Yeah, I think no, that in, I in my agree. opinion, they also need to be permanent as well or at, or at the bare minimum, a loan Going with a buy. to buy. Um, I'm sick of getting January loans and them not working out. Um, we've probably not had a January loan that's that's worked out since, dare I say, Canberra. McLaren. Let me finish. Canberra and McLaren. Um, and that McLaren. changed that changed everyone's perception in Neil Lennon's time at Hibs. So um, I just hope that it's permanent, if it's especially if it's quality. Yeah, <clears throat> well, we'll move on quickly just before we touch on the Hearts game. Uh, a man who was involved in so many uh, Edinburgh derbies scored so many goals against Hearts. It's Derek Rardin's 40th birthday today. So uh, a big happy birthday to Derek Rardin from all of us at the Rambo. Um, I'm sure he's listening. He, I mean, he probably listens every week. When you coming uh, on? When you coming on, Deke? Come on, exactly. Yeah. On the special guest. <laughs> um, Mark, tell us about your favourite Derek Rardin memories. Without a doubt, his goal at Tincastle, his penalty at Tincastle, when the game one 0 I remember yeah. it because we were had such a bad team. We were it was a total makeshift team that and we the I remember in school people saying oh it's gonna be four, five, six nil. There was a few people saying that they're gonna get revenge on the seven nil game. They were expecting a mauling. And so was I, to be honest. And then we pull it out of the bag and Deke scores the winning penalty and it was bedlam, absolute bedlam. My Brilliant. I was watching it on the telly that night. And uh, you know that's that's probably my my favourite my favourite moment. One of the Hearts fans jumped on the pitch to try and attack him as well, and uh, they could they couldn't even uh, get any hits in that way. I think Sean, he was, I think he slipped. I think he did. Uh, yeah. What was your favourite? Um, uh, I'd probably I'd probably say the one at, uh, is, at Easter Road. I think it's his first goal against Hearts. Cuts in, baby faced, thirty five yard thirty yards out, maybe 25, 30 yards out, top bins. 
Um, and obviously he went on to do that on many, many an occasion, cut in and, and hit whether it be with his right or his left. So I'd probably well, say well. he's the most technically gifted two-footed player I've, I've seen at Hibs. Yeah, 260 appearances, 104 goals for Hibs. Some return, like, some return. Uh, so, happy birthday, Deeks. And, um, many bad goals in there either. A lot of them many, are absolutely rad And he doesn't score tap-ins, does he? No. Some boy. I wish we'd had, I wish we'd have him on Sunday. It sums him uh, up, though. We had, he, he cuts in with his right and has a, a, a screamer at Easter Road against Hearts. And then I think it's later on that season or the season after... He goes on his left, shapes up, and hits a thunderbolt with his left into the top bag as well. I mean, it's just unbelievable talent. What a player. He was my favourite player when I was growing up. Uh, the player that I watched that made me fall in love with Hibs. Big Deeks with the, the bleach blonde mohawk. Loved that man. I wish I had a bleach blonde mohawk, even now. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be able to pull it off. Like, I don't even know if he pulled it off either. But you know, I, I wish we did have him in the squad for Sunday. Because it is looking pretty bleak, Mark, isn't it? I don't know if I'd have him in the squad. He is 40 after all, but he's um, certainly good job. a good player back in the day. Like, a good player. Off the bench. <laughs> Who would you go with then as your, as your lineup? We know that Joe Newell's suspended. So we saw JDH coming on at the weekend. Do either of you think that uh, he'll slip right in? I hope not. Um, I'm going to go. I'm going to try and put Porteous at the back with Rocky. I'm swithering on Miller, whether to put Miller in. Is he a right back or a left back? Right back. Right, right back. So I'd probably say him and then put Campbell, McGuinness. I don't really have anyone else in the field, do it? It's either Henderson <laughs> or GDH. Be called Lion Kenny from Ross County. <laughs> Mate, I would have Noah Kenny in that starting 11 every day over GDH or. Henderson. Yeah. I'd rather have one Kenna than both of them playing together. Yeah. No, I agree. I, uh, I'm, I am concerned at, at what the team the team lineup's going to be. I, I actually think that... Um, I actually think Campbell's going to be back at right back again. And I think it will be Doyle Hayes in the middle um, with McGuinness and Porteous. I think that's going to be the midfield three which means that it'll either be Fish or Hanlon, if Hanlon's available, with with Rocky, and I think it'll be Stevenson at, at, at left-back. That's not what I would want, but I think that's what it will be. I would want Big Meg to come in for his, his debut and um, up against Big Barry Mackay. Meg, I wouldn't get a little past, I'll tell you that. Um I think we need we need Ryan Porteous back at centre half, and we need Josh Campbell back in the middle of the park with McGuinness and a another. That a another, I don't want it to be any of the players we have available. So hopefully we bring in an absolute world day and he starts on Sunday. Um, so, but we are going to be struggling. I, I would hope that Trebriya maybe starts at left back, but again he's not getting a look in, and his form's terrible. It's a, it's a guess eh, what's the best of a bad bunch because Stephen's in a bit of a pickle, aren't we? Horrible form think, as well. I think right, I've got I've wrote down my starting eleven now. I think we we can all we can all agree that the front three will be Nisbet, you and 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 McGeady. McGeady. I think we can all agree that, and I think we can all agree that McGuinness will be behind them. It's just and Marshall will be in goal. <laughs> he'll be at centre half. It's those other four positions, five positions that are up for debate. I'm going to say a back three of Porto Hanlon and Rocky with Stevenson and Campbell wink fullbacks, but pushing a wee bit more forward with McGuinness and JDH in the middle, McGeady and Izzy Yuan up top. That's what I'm going for. We're already going to get flooded in midfield there. Eh? That's, yep. that, that's my concern. It happens every day. I think we should, I think, we don't want 100%. Josh Campbell should be in the middle of midfield 100%. And if that means putting Meg in at right wing back or right back or putting Lewis Miller in, then so be it. Cadden might even be fit, I don't know. But um, I think one thing's for sure, if we do sign anyone between now and Sunday, regardless of who they are, 
you know, if we sign Craig Leach or Mark Duncan, they'd need to go straight into the team, surely. Well, the benefit, the benefit that we've got is it's at home. So even if it is Megua or if it is um, Miller or even if Jabriah does come in out of nowhere, we're playing at home. Do you know what I mean? It's not as if you're at Tyne Castle, you've got the fans, on, I mean, the Hibs fans will be on their back <laughs> anyway, but it'll not be the Hearts fans that are, that are on their back. So it's probably an easier game to do something like that. Miller's probably played upwards of about 100 games in Australia before coming over. So it's not as if he's, you know, fresh in regards to his professional career, although he's he's quite young. Um, he didn't start his Hibs career off too well. So even if, if he's fully fit, then he could certainly go in and, um, I don't have a lot of faith in him, but you know he's played plenty of professional games. I'd be happy to see Miller in there um, just to see what he's got. And then the same starting 11 that I've said, except take JDH and then put Campbell in the middle. I would be happy with that if we had a back five with Miller, Porter, Rocky, Hanlon, Stevenson, McGuinness, Campbell. I would be fairly happy with that. Yeah, me too. Certainly no Will Fish <clears throat> playing with Rocky. Nah. Except no... Campbell at fullback, Fish at centre half playing with Rocky, and Porteous in midfield are the three mistakes that if we make, we will probably get beat. I think I think it would be harsh to throw Fish in again against Hearts after what happened the last time. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, but if we get beat on Sunday, lads, do you think it's curtains for Lee Johnson? No, uh, no, but he, he will find it hard to get a lot of the other fans back on his back, uh, back off his back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think I don't think he'll get sacked. No. Yeah. Oh well. It's I going to be a tough. I think one. if we were it going to do it, one. we would have done it before the window as well. Yeah, probably. I think. I don't know. I just, I just kind of fear for if we do get beat. Sorry, not if we do get beat. When we do get beat. No, no, <laughs> on, no, no. on Sunday, nah. I mean, I'm. I can't say I'm confident for the game, but obviously I'm going to go in it with optimism, but. You know, it, it won't it won't be good reading for Lee Johnson. If you were an outsider looking in, you'd be like, how on earth is he still at the club? But we're not going to get anywhere if we keep chopping and changing managers every six months. Yeah. I've said that time and time again. Where, I mean, come quarter to five on Sunday. Is that a three o'clock kickoff on Sunday? Two o'clock, I think. Three o'clock. Well, come quarter to four or quarter to five on Sunday. If I put in the chat Lee Johnson out, just know that I don't mean it. I'm a boy here away. I am a boy here away for being Johnson out club, I must say. I wonder if um, Lee Johnson's starting to maybe re- regret the way that he took the, the League Cup. Well, I don't know. He well, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have known at that point that we were going to draw. No, up. I know. I know. But if you think about it, you've got Kelly and Aberdeen in a semi-final. And regardless of... I mean, Aberdeen were calling for Jim Goodwin's head three weeks ago. Do you know what I mean? And now, now that they're not. So I think maybe that's... They didn't even play bad teams in the League Cup. Like we didn't even play like, like no, our we development. Just, we just squad played Rocky when he, we shouldn't have. Right, it's like we didn't play our development squad. That we played a lot of first team players and we just got beat. Yeah. Oh well. Predictions, boys, for Sunday. Are we allowed to? Part? Are we allowed to do it now, Sean? Or? Oh, of course not we here. can. It's, it's, it's Craig that doesn't like doing it on a on a Monday. I, you can if give Craig me a prediction for a game in four weeks if you want. If Craig doesn't want to know our predictions, then he can just turn off now. Um, know that he'll be listening anyway. I'll say two one Hibs. Go on, Sean. A uh, two or three one Hearts. Oh <laughs> come on, come oh, on. That, that's my head. My, my my head's giving you that answer. If you want my heart, I'm I'm going to say um, one nil McCurdy ninetieth minute. But that's never going to happen. It, does it go a um, extra time? A replay. Does it? All right, well, in that case, I'm going to go... I'd rather get beat. I'd rather get beat than go to Tin Castle, to be honest. I'm going to go 4-3 Hibs. 4-3. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take Nisbet, it. Nisbet, hat-trick plus one. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Nisbet, hat-trick, Cammy Devlin own goal. The worst player in the division. <laughs> I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to say that again. Cameron Devlin is the worst player in the league. Give me, a, give, me a, give me a penalty against Hearts and a Hearts sending off. I feel like it's been so long since we've had either or both of those. Yeah. Well, we had both of them when Riordan scored, didn't we? At Tynecastle. Yeah. That was maybe the last time. Um, 
But yeah, so we'll wrap up with some listener questions. Now it's time to answer the Hibs Ramble listener questions. All right, lads. Um, first of all, I think you know what's coming. Mr. McIntosh is asking what on earth is for dinner. Sean, you were showing us your HelloFresh orders Hello. earlier on. Your HelloFresh. Hello, Hello. Hello Fresh. <laughs> Where are Hello you from fresh. in the country? Uh, yes, so, I was. What are you having? Um, and you were helping me decide, and I think I say we as in like it's going to be me and you that are eating it together. It's definitely not. I mean, we can if you want. Uh, I'll, I'll be on my way. After we're going for it. a linguine and creamy spicy tomato sauce. So I love a I love a wee creamy pasta dish. So I'm excited for it. Creamy spicy tomato, Mark. What would you think about that? That does sound good. That does, that does sound good. Eh? Sounds better well, than what you had last week, Mark. Your uh, oh my god. Listen, the vegan sausage rolls are good, mate. They're good. Please tell me you're having something better. <laughs> no, no, I'm actually going to have them for my lunch tomorrow. But tonight, <laughs> I am having um, spag ball. The good lady wife is currently in the oh. kitchen, whipping it up right now. Vamos, vamos, that sounds good. Uh, I am having sausages and mash with Yorkshire puddings and gravy. Oh, God, that's carbalicious, that. Oh, it's you'll carbal. Be sleeping, you'll be sleeping after that. Oh, mate, I'm, I'm not going to make it to Love Island, eh? I'll be sleeping. Oh. I, mate, I'll be shoveling my face with sausage and mash. Oh, these skinny wee hangs on Love Island. I tell you what, there's, guys. there's one thing I won't be watching tonight, and that's bloody Love Island. Oh, well, I will. I'll update you on what's happening on Please Love don't. Island. Please don't. Well, I will. I'll be on Warzone. Grow a set of balls and meet me there. Well, if I can if I can shove Megan through the bedroom, then I will, and I'll play Warzone with you. Um, next up, Jack asks: Yesterday, Saturday, was the nail in the coffin for Lee Johnson for me? Players' individual attributes being hidden by lack of tactics and chemistry brought by the manager. But what do you think will need to happen for him to get the sack? I think that's a a fairly a, a fair a fair question to be honest. I agree with what you said. Think, yeah. I think a lot of people are in the Lee Johnson out, but I'm not there yet. I don't think we should really be in the business of sacking managers all the time. I think if if we if we get pumped rotten on Sunday, it could do it. <clears throat> it could do it. I'm if not it, saying it should. I'm not saying I want it, but I'm saying it could it could happen. For me, right, if if it hadn't been for Jack Ross and Sean Maloney, I would probably be in the Johnson out club. But my mindset is that we can't just keep on sacking managers. I've got the grass not, isn't always greener on the other side. I asked you that question a few weeks ago, Liam, when it was just me and you. If we hadn't had the Maloney malarkey, would you would you be calling for or Johnson at this point? So and probably a lot. What, of people, did, I, what did I say? You said no. Surprisingly, oh, I really? was expecting you to say oh, yes. Mate, no way. I'd be I'd be getting I'd be wanting about the five reason five is weeks ago. Not, it's not even well. It is obviously the results. It is a results business. But I actually I think what Jack said there is spot on. To be honest, like there doesn't seem to be any tactics. The ch- constant rotation of starting eleven and formations is like I hate that. His behaviour in the media and going out before the derby and all that is I hate that as well. That'll be see, something he'll not be doing on Saturday. Come and see coming at players. I, I I don't like it when managers come after players in press conferences. By all means, go and absolutely slaughter them in the dressing room. But didn't he go and do an interview in, in the media and say, oh, but, but this player's rubbish and I'm getting rid of these? That's Terry Butcher-esque. So yeah. I actually agree with everything he said. But if it, and, but I don't want him to be sacked because I want to give him a chance to give him a couple of windows. But if it hadn't been for Maloney and Ross, then I probably would be in that category. I think we'll yeah. maybe start to see a, a, a string of performances after the window. If if Johnson gets who and what he wants in regards to the players out and players in, um, and it's who he wants, then I think we will start to see you know him actually have an impact on on the squad in regards to a consistent eleven. Yeah, completely agree. Um, next up, Billy asks, "Who's your fullback for the weekend?" We touched on this. Uh, I think I would go for Ken what I'll say Megua and Chibraya. Megua and Chibraya. Oh, God. Chibraya. 
Don't get me bloody started. Is that, a four, is that a four or a three, Liam? That's in a four. So you're taking an L then? Yeah. yeah. I think we'll have to play a back five. I honestly will have to play a back five because we're no good enough in any in full back or centre half to play in a back four or a back three. Well, who are you going with then? You were going for Miller and Stevenson, eh? <laughs> the only reason I'm going for Stevenson is because I think Shibra is worse. I think you'd be better for with Miller and Carter. <laughs> Let's get, on the, let's get on the phone to Verona awful and get part. Josh doing that. <laughs> awful part. There's an awful lot at stake. <laughs> Stevenson, yeah, the only reason I've gone for him is because there's nobody I can think that's actually better. Shabraya, I wouldn't have him doing the pitch inspections before the game. <laughs> the, only, the only good thing Shabraya's done recently is we are some old school... 2002 Preds at the weekend. That's the best oh, thing. I, seen that, aye. I thought they were quite smart, the boots, to be honest. Yeah. Um, next up, Gav Dick. And he'll be happy that Craig's not here to critique his or grammar. I'll tell you my full back options anyway, Liam. Oh, well, I didn't know what I didn't. To be honest, Sean, I couldn't care less <laughs> who you would start. <laughs> who would you start, Sean? Uh, nah, I would, I would, I would start Megua and Trebriya. Um, but I think right it's Stevenson option. and Campbell. Aye, the wrong option. Um, we next all up, start. Let's be serious. I know, but we want him to start. No. Uh, Gav says, do we start Miller for the derby? Hate to criticise Steven- Stevenson because he's been a great servant to the club, but he's passed it. Honestly, if we get pumped, couldn't see anything else other than LJ getting the sack. And also, can I just say, Gav Dick, a massive, massive congratulations because he's spelled everything in the tweet correctly. Put it on a sure? word document before he spelled it. <laughs> I swear I've seen it earlier on and I swear I've seen a mistake. Do we start Miller for the derby? I mean, he's not put a capital M for Miller, but I'm not going to I'm not gonna get bogged down on that. No, no, I think he's, I think he's spelled everything right. And I think, I think, I think yeah, I mean, Miller starting in the derby is a very, very strong possibility, especially the fact that LG's been talking about him uh, coming back from injury and stuff, so I don't know, we've already talked about Johnson getting the sack. It was Gav's, um, Gav's other question that I've seen the mistake in, but that's fine. Oh, has he sent another one as well? All right, I'll, I'll get to that bit when I come here. Um, Lorenzo has said, because the match was so terrible, uh, I've got a food question for you. Now, bear in mind that Lorenzo is Italian, so he's saying, what? Uh, tell me your favourite Italian dish from the following three options. He's put A, lasagna, B, pizza with ham and mushroom, or C, risotto a la milanese. Oh, it's got to be lasagna. Put rice with saffron powder. So I'm not too sure what risotto a la milanese is, but I like mushrooms and ham and pizza, so I'm going to go ham and mushroom pizza. I do like lasagna as well, but... I like pizza, pizza, but no mushrooms. Get them off. Grow up. I know, yeah. I like mushrooms, don't get me wrong. I like mushrooms, but not on a pizza. How? Because I just didn't. Weird. They're dry in that. Weird guy. <laughs> I don't know, how are they dry? Yeah, they're all just mushroomy. Get it <laughs> all right. Fair I dude. fucking hope so, mushrooms are mushroomy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Zach McKenzie has asked, how long can we keep in this bit till someone tries to snatch him? I mean, I'm going to go. It would be... Amazing if we go to deadline day and no one try to come in for them. We'll, I think we'll I'm, just, I'm just glad that Celtic and Rangers don't have any striking problems at the moment. And they've got both of them, especially Celtic, have got more than enough strikers to keep them busy. See if this was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and Nisbet kept up this form, he'd be away in January. <coughs> yeah. yeah. I think we'll keep him till the end of the season, but I think he'll go in the summer to Rangers or something. Probably. If he, doesn't sign a, if he doesn't sign a new deal, we're going to have to sell him in the summer. At this rate, he'll probably go to bloody Aberdeen or something. Okay. Too good for Step that one. Step up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Colin McLennan has asked, can LJ survive uh, in post should the unthinkable happen on Sunday? If he can, apart from myself, who should get the job? Well, I think we can absolutely rule out my dad getting, a, <laughs> getting the head manager's job um, I would get to call it in a heartbeat by the way I tell you what no, nah no way my, I think my dad would be absolutely gammon as Hibs manager to be honest with you 
he gets the players' names wrong all the time, man. He doesn't even care who's playing. Uh, I'd like to see Steve Keane make the step up uh, if Lee Johnson was to was to go. I know that you're a big fan of Steve Keane, Mark. Yeah, I would take Steve Keane. When, before we appointed Johnson, his name was in the mix and I was like, oh no, please do not appoint Steve Keane. But I've done a full 360. Based on turn. Done a full turn on it and now if it was if it was to happen, I would give it to Steve Keane till the end of the season. <laughs> you give done it a, you've done a full team. turn on uh, Josh Campbell as well, eh? Because you weren't his biggest fan. Uh, that's been fairly recent, though. Uh, he, I mean, I, I don't know. He's, sing, he's all right. He's all right. I'm a big fan of Josh Campbell. I am. Huge fan. Who would you have, Sean? Um, I don't know, if I'm honest. I wanted Mowbray and I wanted uh, John Dal Thomas in before Johnson got the job. To be fair, I didn't want Johnson to get the job. I didn't want Ross to get the job and I didn't want Maloney to get the job. So it doesn't so matter doesn't what, matter. I, doesn't doesn't matter matter what I want because I didn't get who I want. <laughs> oh well, that's actually really sad. It's made me quite upset. Are you okay, Sean? I'm more than okay. Do, do you know what? I've changed my opinion. If Lee Johnson gets sacked, bring back Sean. Bring back Sean Maloney. Get him back in. <laughs> Fair dues. Uh, next up, we've got Gav again, and I'm just going to go through this tweet really carefully. Do we start Hanlon for the derby? As Fish was quite poor at the weekend. Also, oh yeah. Also, do Yuzis think Nisbet could leave this month of his good form continues? Gav, with all the good he's work done that. that he did, he's done that on purpose. He's done that on purpose. all the good work that he did, and I think he's realised that he sent a tweet that's been fully comprehensible, and then he's tweeted this one purposely. On yeah. yeah, purposely put mistakes in. Um, I think Hamlin, if he's available, I would start Hamlin if we're playing a back a back three, a back five, whatever you want to call it. Um, even if we're playing a back four, I would put Hamlin and Porteous in. Um, and I don't think we'll sell Nisbet this month, to be honest. I hope not anyway, or else we'll be absolutely rooked. It says it all when we're, when we're wanting Hamlin back in the squad for the derby, considering he's lost probably just over half Darby's he's played in, forty-seven percent. Yeah, that's and Stevenson terrifying start. And Stevenson's it? lost thirty-nine percent of the Darby's oh. he's played Have in. Have we ever had a? I mean, in our lifetimes, I don't think any Hibs players will have a particularly good Derby record. Maybe John McGinn. I think Ricardo Vazte. Uh, Frank Sozzi was never beaten by Hearts. Ricardo Vazte was never beaten, but the only Derby he played in was a draw. He scored. <laughs> Marvin, Marvin Bart. Unless Marvin Bart <laughs> lost his lost his last one, Marvin Bartley was unbeaten against Hearts as well. Was he? Yeah. Oh really? Oh well. Well, Ryan Porteous has never won against Hearts, so that yep. undoes all that. Um, and finally, uh, Jack Hibbs has asked, "What do you think of the Melkerson deal?" Personally, I believe it's a good move for him, and hopefully, if he comes back, he comes back stronger. I think we touched on this earlier on. I think. It's a a good, if not a little bit baffling as to where he's gone. But um, if he comes back, if we get a good player or we get a seven-figure sum for him, I think it's a good deal all round, to be honest. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement that he needs he needs the game time. Um, it's just not worked out for him. I think, considering, I know we were in a very poor place when Nisbet got injured and Maloney was in the squad and that, but we went from... The club bigging him up so much when he first joined. Maloney singing his praises, and then he's only really turned up in one game, which was which was Motherwell away. And now, yeah, but it was game, it was limbs. I know, I know, and I'll, I'll never I'll never forget that. But now we're doing a big massive U-turn, sending him out on loan, and Johnson's not even giving him any game time. So I don't know. I think the plan was probably always to put him out on loan. Realistically, he wasn't ever going to get in ahead of McGeady and his bit boy. No, of course. No, of course. But what I'm saying, he's had the opportunity to do that in the last yeah, 12 months and he's not really taken that opportunity as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, that wraps us up uh, for this evening. Uh, the last time that you'll hear uh, from us before the Derby, the last time you'll hear from me for a couple of weeks, um, I'm away to Tenerife next week. I just had to get in, I had to tell you this. 
had to tell you. So uh, I'll, I'll not be here to review the derby and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not too sure. Um, but no, well, thanks well, again, lads. I will, you should have just, you should have just not said thing. you were away on holiday and then regardless of the result next week, we could have said you were still, still, still out on the lash after the result. No, because that's irresponsible. Liam's gave up the old, the old drinking. Yeah, no. Well, apart from Saturday, I had a few. <laughs> <laughs> and a uh, so I text, uh, he was he was in the harp, and uh, he was like, "Oh, you coming?" I was like, "Aye." He went, "Bought you a pint?" I went, "Oh, I'm not really drinking, mate." But I'll have it anyway. But I'll have a couple. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so thanks again, lads, for joining us. Thank you. It's been, it's been a it's been another good night of chatting shit about the hubs. What is the way to do now? Then go to the gym. Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff. I'm going to get my dinner, put the bear into bed, watch Love Island, and then finish 50th, 37th, and 46th on Morzone. <laughs> I'm off. I'll see you there, soldier. A bash. Right, see you later. Thanks for listening. See you later. Cheers. Cheers.